Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focused Compounding. Thank you so much for tuning in with us here today. I am sitting alongside Jeffrey Gannon. Jeff, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, Andrew. How are you doing? Doing great. We hope everyone else is doing great as well. In today's podcast, we're going to be talking about a post that you had put up on the premium side of things, focuscompounding.com slash app. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody had written in uh, a question to you, which is a perk that... If you do sign up, you will get your questions answered. Yes, and that's a perk we should focus on because I need more questions from people. So, so yeah, email. if you have questions, email them to me. Well, what's your email? Uh, you can use gannoninvesting at gmail.com. Gannoninvesting at gmail.com. And the title of this is, How is a bank like a railroad? And other crazy ideas Jeff has about investing in efficiency-driven businesses. Yeah. So how is a bank like a railroad? Okay, so... I think a bank is like a railroad in that it can be run very efficiently or very inefficiently so that you can have very good returns as a shareholder or very poor returns, but that the competitive landscape doesn't really force that efficiency on the businesses. So um, that's why I always talk about the book Railroader Mm -hmm. to give an idea of the same person going to different railroads in the same industry and making them much more efficient. The thing is an inefficient railroad doesn't fail. And honestly, an inefficient bank doesn't fail. A reckless bank fails, but a f- pretty inefficient small bank does not fail. It stays in business. And you know, if the bank president owns 1% of the bank and if they don't have stock options and if they have a big salary and all those things, then th- how much incentive do they have to run it really efficiently? The incentive there is there for shareholders, whereas other kinds of businesses, restaurants, retailers, things like that, if you don't run them efficiently, you'll start to go out of business because you'll lose customers because your pricing is such an important part of it and all of that sort of thing. But in businesses like this, uh, it's more the difference between are you going to earn a 5% return on equity or a 15? Like the worst one might earn 5%, the best 15. That's all efficiency stuff. But you know what? If you earn a 5% return on equity and you're a small bank, you can keep your job. Like mm-hmm. you can keep running the bank. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I guess to like this owner operator mindset, John Malone, for example, he did so many things that were to the benefit of shareholders mm-hmm. and he had so much skin in the game, even yeah. like different, you know, transfers of wealth and stuff like that mm-hmm. and how we, um, you know, set up different, uh, things for taxes and stuff like that. It was just, he was so focused on that. Yeah. I thought it was interesting in this post you were talking about when I've been asked about, how important a jockey is. Mm-hmm. You said that you'd say, I'd only ever make a pure jockey bet in three situations, an MMA, roll-up business, an insurer, and a bank. Right. That's it. Mm-hmm. And you were talking about, for example, if there's a guy that's been very successful at a certain bank and he was going to leave to maybe start a different one mm-hmm. or join a different one, that's something that you would be very interested in. Yeah. When people ask about jockeys, that's what I talk about. Banks, insurers, and also rolling up an industry is kind of a separate thing. But yeah. Um, I would definitely consider just on the basis of if you had a record of someone running a bank for 10 or 20 years or something, and then they were going to another bank, taking it over or whatever, Mm -hmm. um, the top position there, that alone would get me interested in it. Just the switch in the management, which would not happen in other industries. You know, if just switching who the CEO was Mm -hmm. would not completely change my thoughts on it, whether Mm -hmm. I'd learn about that business. It's funny because when you, I guess, study these businesses that have been like roll ups and stuff like that, or they were very focused on MA and they had a capital allocator at the helm, sort of these great capital allocators that we always reference and talk mm-hmm. about. I think the number one quality about all of them is stinginess. Okay. And you were talking about yeah. it right here. You said you want them to be super stingy when it comes to operating expenses where they do not lift their finger on anything. Right. And you were telling me about, I think it was a bank, mm-hmm. how there was a bank that you knew where they would save all the paper clips. I don't want to butcher. Oh, is this the situation? Yeah, this is, you can uh, people can read this. It's famous. Um, what is the uh, memos from the chairman? Is the book? So it's over there actually. Oh really? Um, memos from the chairman. That's a used book there. But yeah, that's um, that's actually Bear Stearns, and it's one of the um, it's one of the uh, it was uh, uh, one of the memos that he sent out was about paper clips. But there's all sorts of different ones. They he had a sort of um, tried to use humor a lot and things like that. But yeah, the, he wanted to save the paper clips. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the idea being that since everyone received paper clips and stuff, they could do it. And so he wanted them to reuse paper clips, rubber bands, envelopes, um, things like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And a similar one with another bank that I looked at where the CFO was very important to it. Um, what was interesting is learning about how they saved money on some things. And uh, he was very focused on 
trying to eliminate all expenses the customer couldn't see, basically. So um, one of the things he did, which also in memos from the chairman, the exact same thing, is eliminated letterhead. Uh, it's funny because I was reading that and I had happened to be um, remembering uh, an um, interview thing that we did and an article uh, stuff that we read when looking at one bank. And they both have the same thing, which was um, that they told uh, employees, you don't need letterhead, just sign it nice, you know, like get, add nice uh, um, um, uh, you know, just sign it off with something personal and give your signature. And all that we need is where, what it um, comes from. You know, we only need one letterhead for the whole company and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was funny that it happened in two different ones about banks that way, but it sounds like a small thing and it is a small thing. But what I mean is there's lots and lots of stuff at a bank. Uh, there can be where you don't know if it is relevant or not. For instance, you know, honestly, should you, or should you not have letterhead? Does not matter? to have personalized letterhead for each person in the bank that sends out things and stuff. I, you know, I don't know. Um, but certainly there are thousands of banks did it and others didn't. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but it's the kind of thing like in retail, they would know whether this is a, a efficient use of, or not. Um, but it's hard in banking and I think it can be hard in insurance and things like that to know some of those things because it's kind of like, is that an optional expense or not? Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't, and some of these banks are not stingy about some technology stuff and things like that. When they figure out that it works, they invest a lot in that. Um, but there are some other things that they really don't invest a lot in. And, and some of those are, uh, uh, like the other expenses that I talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although what's interesting is many of these actually pay their employees more. Um, uh, that seems to be a common theme that some of the lowest expenses are ones where employees are paid a bit more on average, but they do a lot more work per person. Mm -hmm. So they're paid, you know, 110% of an average, yeah. but they're doing 150% Even we've spoken work. with um, some, you know, employees of banks and yeah. you could tell that they, that's very much the situation. So you were talking about two combinations mm -hmm. of, of factors that you think work really well. And you said one, a low all in cost of funding, non-interest expense plus interest expense divided by total deposits mm -hmm. is very low. It's great. And then you said number two, an almost non-existent charge off rate. So I thought this was interesting because you said if you have a low cost of funding, you can make low interest loans and right. still turn a profit. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have low charge offs, you can make low interest loans and still turn a profit. So you're kind of like handicapping different ways. Right. Um, so I thought that was you know, interesting. So kind of talk to me about that because I think also in this article, you're talking about the return on equity at certain banks, it doesn't tell you the whole story until you learn about, you know, what exactly they're doing. Like if they have a 15% return on equity versus right. maybe a 5% return on equity, you're like, well, is that good? We don't know yet. You have to kind of figure out more about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So I hear people talk. So there's two kind of things that people do talk a lot about. Um, they seem to talk a lot about the efficiency ratio, mm -hmm. which is an industry uh, measure. And it's kind of like reverse. It's, it's kind of like uh, the expense ratio of an insurer is one way of thinking about it. So they're using the non-interest expense that they have relative to the amount of revenue that they bring in. I think it's better to use it relative to the amount of assets, though with many banks it won't matter. But so like say you have – your assets are basically going to be pretty similar to your deposits and stuff. So we could use that or your earning assets. Mm -hmm. So like if you have deposits or loans at many banks or loans and securities um, of say $100 million and you're spending $2 million, uh, on non-interest expenses, then that's basically can be compared that 2 million to that 100 million and say that it's about a 2% cost that you have. And then you have to add on to that your interest cost. So the people in a sense are looking at the two things I care about, which is the efficiency ratio, like we said. I don't really look at it as the efficiency ratio, but that's fine. And then the um, they focus on the net interest margin. And I don't really like the net interest margin as a measure to focus on with a bank. Um, because I would rather, I mean, I think it's very hard to find situations where you'd want to invest in a bank that isn't a very low cost producer of money, basically. So it can either have almost no interest costs or almost no non-interest costs, or it could have a mix of two pretty low numbers or whatever, but you want something that is, you know, that has a 2% all in cost or something, and then can go and lend at 4%. I wouldn't feel as good about something that had a um, 4% all in cost and was lending at 6%, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and, but in terms of like a net interest margin, it wouldn't show you the difference there. It just is a, the difference between what your costs are in terms of your interest uh, costs only. It's not taking into account your non-interest and then what you're lending at. 
And I just think it's very hard to lend at higher rates than others are and do as well. I think that it really needs to be on the cost side that you have an advantage. Now, I, it could be either part of it. It could be lower rates that you're paying out, or it could be, which generally doesn't mean lower rates. It means more non-interest deposits, or um, it could be very low uh, expenses of running your bank. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things. And so that's why I mentioned that sometimes banks I talk about look completely the opposite from each other. But if you do the all in calculation, it turns out that one that has like 0% interest, it's paying out and has like 1.9% uh, non-interest expense. And the other that's like 0.8%, um, non-interest expense and like 1% interest. Well, actually those two have the same basic all in cost, which is that they're spending about 2% of their total, um, uh, of the total earning assets that they have in expenses, both non-interest expense and interest expense. Do you think that becomes more important going forward because of where rates are? Yeah. So this is a thing that I think is like, um, people ask a lot about this stuff and I, I don't know about just cutting rates that far as being an effective way to get money out into the economy for banks uh, because you're putting money through banks. And sure, a bank that doesn't really have its own deposits, a bank that's just obtaining wholesale money or getting money basically from different government things and whatever, um, suddenly has a much cheaper source of funding, right? So if you're going out short term borrowing in the market for short-term money, you're paying those kinds of rates, and then you're turning around and you're lending long, then the cut in rates completely works like one-to-one -one in lowering your cost. And so that can lower rates you know, that you give to borrowers and all that. And it can help your uh, capital over time because you'll earn more money and all those sorts of things. But that's not how most banks work. Most banks have pretty meaningful expenses that are not reduced at all by cutting interest rates. So you can cut it, like if a bank has 2% non-interest cost versus its funds, right? Mm -hmm. And it was borrowing at 1%, and now you say, okay, now you can borrow at 0%. Well, we've lowered it from three to two, but that's all that we've done. And so we can't really do any more than that. I mean, at that point, the bank just isn't making any money and stuff if it would ever have rates that get towards that point. And so I don't know that it's as simple as people explain it when they talk about those things. And I think it's a problem when I look at like European banks or all those sorts of things when people talk about what's the problem with really low rates. The problem with really low rates is that what a bank actually does costs money and it has some expenses that it can't get rid of. And so you can't just push rates all the way down to zero and think it'll work because they're not just a middleman that just borrows and then turns around and lends. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, the government can set up things like that if it wants to, but that's not the banks that people have their money in and that they're borrowing from in our society. That's not how they're set up right now. Uh, they do other things. You know, you're using them for transaction purposes and mm -hmm. stuff. You're using them for that convenience of that. And that's different than just like a lending program. Got it. And then later on in the article, you said, instead, I look for three things in banks. You said, mm -hmm. aim to have very low charge-offs on their loans. I think it's more achievable to eke out an extra 1% from charge-off reduction to basically nil than it is to eke out 1% by making 5.5% yield loans instead of 4.5% yield loans. And you said, number two, specialize. Number three, diversify. So I'm kind of curious about number two and three, because yeah. to me, they seem very different. Right. So I think uh, this gets into all sorts of things about the safety of banks and all those sorts of things. So the first thing is banks are generally U.S. banks that you come across are generally much, much safer than you think, um, like the investors think. OK, actual bank failures are like even in the middle of a financial crisis or something, maybe one out of 50 banks on average might fail in a given year. OK, these are like at levels that are like, will we have another pandemic like COVID next year? That's about the same odds as will this bank fail if you pick a bank randomly? Will it fail this year? So it's just very low that way. But that doesn't mean that they won't have some problems that will really hurt the growth of the bank for a long time to get through those charge offs and all the things that they have. So they need to be able to um, not have very high losses for a long time. And we looked at those banks like from 10 years ago, and you can see that for years, they had uh, an effect of really hurting their returns as they worked through the problems that they had in the financial crisis. It went on for years and years. So even though they didn't fail, they had that problem. So you need, you want to have almost no charge offs or very strong capital position that way. And to me, that means you want to specialize because I think that's your best way to make money lending, but I also think it's your best way not to do dumb mistakes. So specialize in your, your same geographic area, um, which many banks do. Uh, that's pretty typical. And then you also want to specialize, I think, by 
certain kinds of loans or certain industries, things like that. But then you have to diversify because you would not want something to be uh, 100% in only one kind of loan. Um, and the best way to do that is to pick a category that you're in that um, is not highly correlated. So the biggest danger I see usually when someone is talking about, well, how does this, um, the different industries that they're in, how do they match up and stuff, is that the bank is simultaneously making a meaningful amount of like construction loans and then is huge in home uh, mortgage stuff. Mm -hmm. And those two can go bad at the same time. In fact, what you learn in many cases was that those construction loans and stuff were really loans for like land banks at home builders, which is very similar to the loans that they're making as like the mortgage loans and stuff. So it was all basically a bet on one thing. They go boss at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Whereas if you're doing two different kinds of lending um, that aren't really that connected, then you'd be a lot safer that way. Or like something like Frost or something, if you actually don't do that much lending. So if you have a big securities portfolio. So obviously that helps too. So, you know, if you had, for instance, say you had a bank that was 50% in different bonds and things, 25% in one loan category, 25% in the other. You know, that's the kind of diversification I'm talking about. It's actually not a lot of diversification. It's only three different things that you own. But the odds that, you know, the municipal bonds you own go bad at the same time that the home mortgage loans that you own go bad at the same time that the commercial mortgage stuff goes bad is just not that likely. Um as opposed to what you'll see with most banks, which is much more of a mix of 5% in this category, 10% in this category, all that sort of stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. I want to take it a different, you know, direction okay. then. So you have efficiency in railroads, you have efficiency in banks. What do you think is efficiency in just the general standard business? <laughs> What's efficiency to you? Well, the difference I think is that most businesses are much more competitive. So efficiency is forced upon the business owner. So actually they're going to be out of business. Right. So the difference between a manager, a professional manager and a business owner is not very big owner operator. But when you get into things where you have monopolies and stuff like that, um, it becomes very big. So it's a very big difference. So there's some businesses where I would say if you have professional management, it wouldn't really change things that much. They're going to do their best to run the business and everything, but they're not necessarily that concerned with getting you your best returns, but their competitors, that rivalry in the industry is going to force it on them. So, um, like it depends, but I would say generally in things like restaurants and retail and stuff, it, I don't know that it matters as much to have an owner operator running it as much as it would to have someone who's really smart about the industry and knows it, you know? Um, if you had a fashion retailer thing, so having someone who just is very knowledgeable about fashion stuff and knows how to run that and has no skin in the game might be better for you than having, um, an owner operator because they're going to like, it's just so competitive that, you know, if you don't take retail or something, right. If you don't cut your costs down, you can't stay in, the, you actually will start losing money and stuff to people who are cutting their costs. If, if Walmart is lowering their costs 2% a year for years and you're not, their price is going to be so much under you that they're going to get all the business and stuff. Sure. That's not going to happen in banking. You're not going to steal all because you run your bank more efficiently. That's not going to help you steal all the business across the street from you. Um, even, you know, what make, what does steal business then? It's almost impossible, I think, to steal business from, uh, for, unless they mess things up. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some banks that took business from people in the financial crisis, things like that. When banks merge, you could take some of their business. Um, yeah, if a bank's supposedly in trouble, if there's a scandal, if they merge, if they raise their fees on something, so they do stuff like that. They, you could annoy you, they could annoy their customers enough to drive them to start looking around. But if a bank is doing things well enough, if that 5% ROE bank is really pleasing its customers, I don't think you can take their customers very well at all. Um, now, I mean, you could give them a loan by just offering uh, better terms to them. Mm -hmm. That's not a way to like make a lot of money. That's not a way to safely do things. But sure, in insurance and banking both, you can be looser than your competition on that side of things, sure. But I think it's very hard to take uh, a customer from someone else. So industries where it's very easy to take a customer from someone else, I think it doesn't matter as much. Like I really think that if someone is great at coming up with a restaurant concept, it doesn't matter if they have a lot of skin in the game or not. Because if you aren't great at it, you're going to be out of business. Whereas like you could see this just by looking at banks and stuff. How many of them fail? It's not a very high number. Um, and how many of them have been around forever in their area and still aren't push out of business even when they're not that great mm -hmm. there are banks that trade under book value all the time and yet they're still staying in business it if you mess up things in restaurants and retail and stuff for very long you're out of business yeah. two quarters of losing money you're done yeah 
Yeah. So that's why I just think in terms of your returns, they're going to be so huge. Uh, the differences are going to be so big. Um, I think there's much less risk in banking than people think of actually losing all your money in a bank stock. Uh, I know that surprises people, like, but I think you'd be surprised the risk that if you own it long enough, a retailer or a restaurant or something will cause you to lose all your money, maybe higher than you think compared to banks. But what is going to be very different from bank to bank is how much wealth creation there is. Cause there are tons of banks that create no wealth over time. They, they earn a return, mm-hmm. but they're like some life insurers I've seen. I've seen some family controlled life insurers. They've literally been around for 50 years earning less than their cost of capital. Um, so the family had some money to start with. They still have some money adjusted for it now. But honestly, if they put their money in an index fund instead of putting it in, in the life insurer that they controlled, um, they'd be many, many times richer by now. But they don't care. You know, They're never going to go out of business doing it. Mm-hmm. So they can earn their 5 or 6% a year forever. Um, and I think banks are the same way. There are some banks that are 5 to 6% return on equity right across the street from one earning 15 to 16%. And it's who's running it that makes a very big part of the difference and what the culture is. What about the culture? Well, that's hard to, I mean, yeah, go ahead. We've been in some and mm-hmm. they very much acknowledge that they have sort of that stinginess or maybe they're just telling us what we want to hear. But it, it definitely seemed just from walking around. Look, we are in a bank and how many employees do you think were in there? You have four people working in that, that one was, proximity of people. <laughs> that, one, that, one was un- yeah, that one was unusual. I've never seen something like that. Yeah. So that was a very unusual one. We and took a tour of some place. High returns, you're like, oh, wow. Yeah. We took a tour of some place that um, I've never seen anything like that in terms of how um, focused they were on expense control that way. Um, and, and also not just how focused they were on expense control, but what we were mentioning before is like, what stuff that a customer doesn't have to see can be very, very cheap and stuff mm-hmm. that, that kind of idea. It, it's like an idea that you would have in other industries in like, um, you know, if you were serving a much, um, you know, if you were like a, it's a kind of thinking that you would have if you were like a Costco or something like that kind of thinking about costs and, and things like that, even though you, it's easy not to have that kind of thinking in an industry where you're, um, uh, usually there's more, differentiation from employees in terms of perks and offices and things than what we saw there. There's lots of problems that you can run into that way. And um, we've talked a little bit about that before. Some banks, one problem that they have and why you get people leaving them to smaller banks and stuff is because it turns into a committee thing, obviously. The banks get too big. The loan sizes are really big. It goes through all the stuff. They can't move very fast. One thing you will notice um they don't like one thing banks will say sometimes in terms of lending, which is absolutely true. And I think investors don't appreciate enough is they'll be like one of our key competitive advantages is our speed of making decisions. Sure. And if you're a borrower, especially if you're doing commercial things or whatever, it's very important to get a quick answer. That's what you want more than anything. And we'll do a lot with that bank probably. So while there are lots of things that matter, the thing that I think investors might uh, overlook is like how quickly they can give you a yes or no to something um, because if you're someone who does a bunch of different deals and things, this is going to happen a lot that you're going to want that. And yeah, there's lots of business where that's true, but speed and decision-making stuff is very important. And it's hard for a very big bank to keep up with a very small bank that way. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the reasons I would say that you see good people leave a big bank for a smaller one. And you might want to look to follow those people, like see what they're doing and why they're going to this other bank and all that. And I've seen that plenty of times. Yeah. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning with Jeff and I on uh, today's podcast. Make sure to hit the subscribe button both on YouTube and the podcast app. Download our app, focuscompound.com slash app uh, for more content where we actually uploaded this um, uh, post that we just went over. I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with both of us and we will see you in the next podcast.